WCW Sold Out 99 took place on January 17th in Charleston, West Virginia. Just under 11,000 fans are in attendance and the show got around 330,000 pay-per-view buys. This isn't too bad seeing as the main event was only announced on the previous episode of Nitro. Also, it should be pointed out that this event sold better than 1998's Fall Brawl, Halloween Havoc and World War 3 shows. It didn't outsell Starcade of course, but it goes to show that WCW's pay-per-view business was still fine after the finger poke of doom incident, contrary to popular belief. As a matter of fact, Super Brawl 9, the next WCW pay-per-view that takes place in February, sells even better than sold out. Anyway, this is the first WCW pay-per-view under the presidency of Ric Flair, and Ric promises that WCW will triumph over the NWO tonight. This show is not a joint production between WCW and NWO as evidenced by the NWO logo getting covered up in the sold out logo, but let's see if WCW really can overcome the NWO tonight or if sold out's going to be the same story as always. Headlining sold out this year is a ladder match featuring Scott Hall and Bill Goldberg. A kettle prod's going to be suspended above the ring and whoever zaps their opponent first wins the match. At the start of the show however, we see that Goldberg's been attacked and he's maybe going to go into this one at a disadvantage. We have also got the WCW in-ring debut of David Flair when he and his dad take on Kurt Hennig and Barry Windham. That should be a barrel of laughs I'm sure. The first WCW pay-per-view match of 1999 features Mike Enos taking on Chris Benoit, an absolute random match that has no build-up at all. As a matter of fact, I don't think Mike Enos has ever been featured in a proper storyline in WCW, so fans are expected to just enjoy this one for the in-ring action and nothing more. Enos established early on that he's the bad guy in this affair when he tried a cheap shot after a clean break, and the crowd booed the former Beverly brother when he attacked Benoit in the corner. Enos also spat on Chris, so Benoit replied by blowing his nose on his opponent. That's what being a horseman's all about, I guess. Dirty bastard. Benoit gets put down a few times, but he comes back with a hard, fast clothesline. Enos gets his ass kicked in the corner, Benoit then performs a dragon screw and Enos screams in agony after taking a knife edge chop. Mike gets a chance to show what he can do with a tilt word backbreaker and a power slam. He then excites the crowd no end with a big old bear hug. There's bear hug number two ladies and gents and remember, pay per view opening match. Benoit gets out, he takes a knee to the midsection and look at the absolute state of Mike Enos's chest. Benoit's chops were no joke. Chris takes the advantage again when countering a back suplex into a crossbody. From here Benoit pulls off two German suplexes before going upstairs for the diving headbutt. Chris then counters a suplex attempt into a crippler cross face and Benoit wins the match via submission. A poor opening match here from WCW. The competitors had nothing going into it and when it began the action was pretty dull. Now, this is better. Norman Smiley murdered Pepe on Nitro this past week by throwing Chavo's hobby horse into a wood chipper. Doing the big wiggle on Pepe wasn't enough apparently, so Pepe's now in horsey heaven and Chavo's out for revenge. Norman carries an urn to the ring that contains the remains of Chavo's dead stallion and Chavo doesn't take too kindly to this. Smiley taunts Chavo both inside and outside the ring, but all this does is piss Chavito off and Norman goes down after a dropkick and a clothesline. Smiley gets sent out of the ring and Chavo follows with a plancha, and already the crowd are making a lot more noise when compared to our opening match. Chavo keeps the pace up with a springboard bulldog followed by a top rope crossbody. He gets caught out though when Norman drops him on the top turnbuckle. In Luke, Norman teases the big wiggle and the crowd boos when he doesn't do it. Even Shivani admits that Norman has fans here in Charleston. How can you not be a fan of this great man anyway? Norman pulls off a great looking smiley slam and he gives the fans the Norman shuffle. It gets a great pop. The chin lock that followed though got an even bigger pop from me. A Norman chant then breaks out in the arena as Chavo misses a springboard Vader bomb, so Norman keeps it on the mat by twisting Chavo up like a pretzel. Norman's just transitioning from submission move to submission move here as the crowd continue to chant his name, but to be fair they do give a loud cheer when Chavo gets up and Norman takes a clothesline. Norman gets a chance to show off his submission skills again following a swinging neckbreaker. The commentators are very impressed that Smiley's ground game right here as Chavo gets schooled on the mat. 
but Norman's more than a grapple king my friends because he can also dance as proven after Chavo gets floored with a back elbow. Back to the mat we go with Norman stretching Chavo's arms while sinking his feet into Guerrero's shoulders. The two then head upstairs and Smiley pulls off a superplex and it's time. Norman's feeling it, he feels it on the mat after pulling off that superplex. It's time for the big wiggle and already this pay per view's been saved from mediocrity, you love to see it. After launching Chavo high into the air, Smiley decides to bring it down for some more stretching and gotta say, he knows how to pace a match. Normally, <laughs> normally. But usually this kind of map based wrestling loses a crowd if overdone but Norman's bringing the crowd up and down quite well while sprinkling in big offensive moves and big wiggles in between submission holds. Chavito's sleeper gets countered with a back body drop, Chavito then gets dumped out of the ring like he's nothing at all, and to add insult to injury, Norman performs the gory special. Smiley's got Chavo's number here. You think this is disrespectful? Well, check this out, wheelbarrow wiggle. You can hear Norman's hand slap across Chavo's ass with a lot of vigour and purpose. Our, ma <laughs> our match comes to an end when Chavo counters the Norman Conquest, but he feels the land is Tornado DDT. Smiley then grabs the urn and he throws Pepe's remains all over Chavo, and Norman then applies his finisher. Chavo taps out to the Norman Conquest that sold out. A tremendously fun match that had a great balance of comedy, mat wrestling and high impact moves. For me personally, this one's gonna be hard to beat. Another match that had no build up whatsoever takes place next, it's Van Hammer vs Finley. I'm not going to go into detail with this one because I'm sure you guys care just as much as the fans who attended Sold Out cared. The commentators haven't received an update on Goldberg and they're teasing that our main event may not happen tonight. Usually you'd ignore this kind of thing but WCW have been pulling some fast ones on fans recently so you just never know with this company. Not much to say about this match really, a standard back and forth affair that felt like your standard Nitro bout with a little longer run time. Normally I like to point out a few of the bigger moves and moments that happen in matches that I don't cover in detail but there's nothing here. There's nothing that stands out and seeing as the audience have no investment in either wrestler they stay pretty silent for the entire bout. Finley wins with his tombstone pile driver as expected and you know if you're going to charge fans a premium to watch this show on television I do think an effort should be made to put on matches that at least include one guy that fans can rally behind and if you get put in a random match on pay per view with no build and no story you better have something in there that'll make fans remember your performance. Our next match Bam Bam Bigelow vs Wrath at least has a little heat going into it. These two had a match two weeks ago on Nitro which was ruled a double count out. They just beat the hell out of each other on the rampway and then last week Wrath interfered in Bigelow's match against Scott Hall. So we at least have something for this one and also either man pulling off their finisher on the other right here is gonna look impressive. I'm actually interested in seeing how this one ends. It's Wrath who overpowers Bigelow at the opening bell but Bam Bam gets the best of Wrath the second time around. Bigelow goes down after a bicycle kick though and the beast from the east takes a short time out afterwards. When the match resumes Wrath hits the mat following a shoulder block but Bam Bam misses a headbutt. This allows Wrath to get up and plump Bigelow face first into the canvas and the back and forth action continues with a corner splash from Bam Bam and a second rope clothesline from Wrath. Bigelow clearly knows how to put Wrath in his place as he applies a devastating chin lock and Wrath's now an easy target. He goes down after a clothesline and once again after a body slam, Bam Bam pulls off a quick headbutt and there it is, chin lock number 2, don't tease us like this Mr Bigelow. These two seem so evenly matched as Wrath hits a drop kick while Bigelow replies with a power slam. Bigelow then gets a chance to win it with a DDT but Wrath gets a foot on the ropes and both men end up going down when they both go for a running crossbody. The match then ends a little abruptly when Wrath hits his head on the ring post after missing a corner attack. Bam Bam gets the big man up and there it is, greetings from Asbury Park. Bigelow defeats Wrath in a decent matchup that I think could have been better if they were given an extra few minutes. As for the outcome, it was Bigelow who needed to win. We already know Wrath isn't moving anywhere in regards to his position on the cards, so Bam Bam right now has much more upside. Conan was kicked out of the NWO last Monday and he also got attacked by his former Wolfpack teammates. So not only does K-Dog want some revenge tonight against Lex Luger, he also wants Lex to, and I quote, toss his salad and peel his potatoes. <laughs> that, that, that's pretty rough. 
I'm interested in seeing if Lex steps it up a notch in this match though, or if Conan's going to step it down in order to work at Lex's rather predictable pace. Flexi Lexi comes down to the ring, he grabs a mic and he says, Yes Mr. Dog, I would love to toss your salad. Nah, only joking. Lex gives Conan a chance to walk away from the match. When it comes to the NWO, Conan just didn't make the cut, so he can leave the ring now and save himself from an ass kicking. This leads the K-Dog firing up on Lex big time and the crowd goes absolutely crazy after Luger gets robbed in the corner. The fans have turned their backs on the red and black and they love Conan. Looks like Conan's gonna make Lex work for it tonight as the total package takes an inverted atomic drop and a clothesline. So Lex gets himself out of the ring following a back elbow to get a breather. He's not used to this at all is he? Conan goes out and Lex Luger ends up back in, and Conan stays pretty relentless as he kicks Luger in the ribs before stomping on his opponent like he owes him money. When Conan misses a dropkick though and the momentum shifts to Lex, the pace of the match gets brought way, way down. Lex stomps on Conan as the crowd boos, Luger takes a moment to pose before hitting Conan with a few knee strikes to the back. Lex then focuses on the lower back with a few forearms, and Conan brings the crowd back into it when he bashes Lex's head off the top turnbuckle but he can't follow up afterwards. On the outside, Lex continues working over the back by pushing Conan into the ring apron, and back inside the ropes, it's a bear hug. A long drawn out bear hug. When Conan fights out, he gets put down again with a clothesline, and K-Dog's like, fuck it, I'm done with this guy. So he leaves the ring to regroup for a few moments. Conan again rolls out of the ring when the match resumes, so I'm now assuming the K-Dog got hurt. You can even see him telling Lex something on the outside, and Luger then gets in the ring to waste some time. When the match resumes, Conan struggles to fire up. He hits his rolling lariat just fine, but look at his Irish whip that follows. Either he's hurt or he's doing a fine sale job. Conan performs his seated dropkick with very little speed behind it, and the match ends with Miss Elizabeth walking down to the ring just as Conan hits the K-Factor. K-Dog locks in the Tequila Sunrise, but Liz sprays Conan's face with black paint. This allows Lex to lock in the torture rack, and Conan gives it up. After the match, K-Dog's carried to the back by the referee and a trainer, though he ended up returning to the ring two days later, so it's all good. If Chris Jericho can beat Saturn tonight at sold out, then Perry's gonna have to wear a dress for the remainder of his career. Saturn only agreed to this so he could get his hands on Jericho. Saturn's also been having some issues with referee Scott Dickinson as of late and Chris Jericho's been stirring the pot a little. Scott's also the referee for this matchup, so the folks at the WCW executive committee aren't doing a very good job, are they? Chris keeps a headlock applied following a middle rope takeover, but he's not so successful on the second attempt. The commentators let us know that there's still no updates on Goldberg's medical condition as Saturn kicks Jericho right on the head, and we then get treated to more chinlock action and sold out. Jericho manages to kick Perry in the corner and he chokes Saturn out with his boot. Saturn's having none of that though, so he gets up, he slaps Jericho across the face, he hits a front spin kick that made no contact whatsoever. Still though, Perry makes up for it with his springboard leg drop. Ralphus shows us Perry's dress on the outside, a little leopard print number that was hand selected by Chris himself I assume. The action continues with a Chris Jericho springboard drop kick followed by a plancha to the outside. Saturn then takes a front suplex on the floor and a vertical suplex brings Perry back into the ring. Saturn gets all fired up when Jericho disrespects him with a cocky pin attempt. Jericho replies instantly with a big boot followed by a back senton. The Ayatollah then gets a chance to hit his land salt but Saturn blocks it, and Saturn also blocks a second rope aerial attack with a gargoyle suplex. Perry stays one step ahead of Chris by dodging a dropkick attempt and Jericho gets catapulted out of the ring. Saturn's eager to win this one though so he brings Chris back inside the ropes and we see a big splash that unfortunately only gets a two. The match ends when Chris avoids hitting the mat following a top rope back suplex. Saturn goes for the death volley driver, Chris counters it into a land tamer attempt, Perry manages to get out of it, and Saturn then counters the suplex into a small package. Scott Dickinson rolled Saturn over so it's Jericho who's now pinning Perry, and a fast count from the dodgy referee secures Chris a victory. This means Perry Saturn must wear a dress, and Chris just doesn't watch his opponent put on his new threads, no he jumps up and down with joy as he puts it on. Perry looks humiliated and defeated as he walks around the ring wearing the dress. Jericho, Ralphus and Dickinson laugh as they leave the ring. And there you have it. Perry looks pretty good in a dress. I don't see what the big problem is.
David Flair says he's not a wrestler and he's only wrestling this match tonight out of respect for his father. He wants to leave tonight still being David Flair while also earning the respect of the nature boy. We're gonna see David in action later on, let's hope he wrestles better than he talks. The Cruiserweight title's on the line next in a four corners match. Champion Kidman vs Rey Mysterio, Juventud Guerrera in Psychosis. This is not an elimination match, you gotta get a tag if you want to legally enter the match. Whoever scores the first pinfall or submission will leave the show as Cruiserweight Champion. There's some confusion over who's meant to start the match and Tony Schiavone even apologizes twice on commentary for getting it wrong. There was supposed to be a coin toss apparently and no one seems to know who won that coin toss. But we've got Kidman and Mysterio starting us off and Ray gets the better of Kidman right off the bat with a head scissor takedown. This gets followed with Kidman's slingshot head scissor takedown. The two then clash into each other and the heels of the match think this is a great opportunity to get inside for a few cheap shots. So Ray decides to tag in Psychosis while Kidman tags in Hoovy. Bobby Heenan rightfully points out that this makes no sense when you consider the rules of the match. Basically, Kidman's letting two guys fight for his cruiserweight belt, but the two former LWO members go to work and Hoovy applauds his opponent after Psychosis almost pinned him. Things get a bit ropey next when the two try to counter each other's moves, but they still show each other respect after their brief scuffle, and then they try to tag out. Neither Kidman nor Ray are in any rush to get back in the ring though, so Hoovy and Psychosis just hug in the middle of the ring. Not sure what's going on here. Eventually though the babyfaces do get inside the ropes and we get some double team moves from Kidman and Rey including an assisted BK bomb and this flying crossbody that Rey Mysterio set up quite nicely. It looks like Psychosis and Kidman are now the legal men as Kidman takes a falcon arrow but the match breaks down when all four men get involved again. Not gonna lie, this match hasn't really been doing it for me so far which is odd seeing as I usually really enjoy these kind of matches on pay per view. Ray gets sent into Kidman on the outside, Hoovy and Psychosis then try to outdo each other and they argue on the apron. This leads to both men taking sunset power bombs and back in the ring Hoovy falls victim to a springboard doomsday device. Kidman then dives to the outside and he lands on Psychosis. Hoovy sees this as a perfect opportunity to pull off a dive of his own while using Ray as a springboard. This looked awesome by the way. And if you think that was good, Ray Mysterio follows up by diving over the referee straight to the outside. Unfortunately, he lands on Kidman though and he seems a little upset at this turn of events. But there's no time to cry about it Ray, there's a title up for grabs. So Ray tries to end it with a springboard sit down sent on. Juventud kicks out and he performs the Jovi driver. But look at this, look at how Psychosis breaks up the pin, my my. We get more spots on the outside with Psychosis diving over the top rope and landing on Kidman and Mysterio. Hoovy once again tries to end it back in the ring but Mysterio makes sure Kidman doesn't fall victim to the Hoovy driver. Ray then gets distracted fighting Psychosis on the outside and this allows Kidman to perform the shooting star press. And that's the match over, Kidman wins via pinfall. Never thought I'd say this but this cruiserweight title match was messy, there were some great spots as always but the flow of the match was all over the place. The WCW cruiserweights always had an excellent way of balancing big spots with logical match progression but this one just seemed all over the place. The Starcade triple threat match last month seemed like it was carefully and meticulously planned whereas this seemed like it was put together on the fly. That might work with two guys but with four guys it just falls apart unfortunately. It is a shame but I've no doubt in my mind that they'll come back with more bangers as soon as Nitro tomorrow night. Booker T is talking to Mark Madden about the Jericho vs Saturn match. Booker isn't happy about how it ended and this leads to Chris Jericho showing up and offering Booker a match tomorrow night on Nitro. This directly rectifies a complaint I had on the last episode of Reliving the War about Booker T's recent matches having no rhyme and no reason, so I say this is a good move from WCW. Next up it's Rick and David Flair vs Barry Windham and Kurt Hennig. The Nature Boy originally booked this one as a 2 on 1 match when he became president of WCW but David said he wanted to team up with his daddy. Rick was hesitant but Arn Anderson said David was ready and it was time to let the boy become a man. Alright he didn't really say that but he should have. David's appearances on Nitro so far have not been great. Granted he hasn't done a whole lot but you can tell he's a little nervous and a little unsure of himself. So why they give David a pay per view match when you've got someone like Booker T sitting beside Mark Madden is totally beyond me. Let's not pass judgement just yet though and let's see what happens in our semi main event. 
Flair calls his opponents horsemen rejects, while Kurt Hennig tells Arn Anderson to leave the ringside area. Flair says Kurt better get in the ring now or he'll be looking for a job in the WWF later tonight. And gotta say, during this time period, that's not much of a threat, is it? Barry wants young David in the ring and it looks like Davey just shit his pants, but he steps up to the plate and he tries an amateur takedown. Wyndham's a big boy as we all know, so nothing comes of it. Barry pulls off a headlock takeover and David totally misses a head scissor afterwards, forcing Barry to put his head in between David's legs and yeah, not the most graceful start to your WCW in-ring debut. Kurt Hennig tries to interfere but he gets scared when Rick starts nature. So we go back to Wyndham and David and swear to god, I don't know if David's really nervous right now or if he's trying to look all super intense. Either way, it's not working. He gets lured in easily with a test of strength, he counters a body slam, Barry takes a few chops and David pulls off a hip toss. Wyndham's forced to sell this by the way and he looks intimidated by the almighty David Flair, but thankfully he snaps out of it and David ends up taking that body slam. Kurt Hennig shouts, now you look like a flair as David lies on the mat which did give me a little chuckle I must admit. David tags out after Barry misses an elbow drop and Tony Schiavone says David did a pretty darn good job for his first time in the ring. Fuck off, Tony. Slick Rick then beats up both Wyndham and Hennig. The flurry ends with Wyndham taking a backdrop. Barry finds himself in the opposition's corner and he seems baffled that David isn't taking advantage of this rather obvious opportunity. So Barry tells David to hit him and David does this. What, what exactly is he doing here? Kurt tags in, he takes it to Flair in the corner and at this point in the match I just want to see David wrestle, it's so entertaining for all the wrong reasons. Flair chops Kurt so hard that the former Mr. Perfect ends up on the top rope. Rick delivers an elbow to Kurt's gut, Hennig replies with a chop of his own followed by his signature rolling snapmare and <laughs> look, I like how David just plunged off the apron and it looked like he fell about 60 feet into the abyss. From this point on, David doesn't get tagged in again. The remainder of the match is Flair taking a beating from Wyndham and Kurt. Flair tries a top rope move but it doesn't work out too well as usual. David gets in the ring and he causes more harm than good by distracting the referee. Wyndham pulls off a fantastic superplex and it only gets him a too. And while Rick does his best to fight these two guys off, he's having a real hard time of it because his son's pretty useless right about now. We even see the flare flop at one point, indicating that the nature boy has been truly worn out. Kurt puts Flair in the figure 4 and all David can do is look on. Barry Windham even helps out here and David just… claps. He looks exhausted, poor fella. Eventually, it all gets too much for poor David and he has to step in to help his dad. Billy Silverman keeps Davey in the corner though and again, I have no fucking idea what's going on here. What are they, are they dancing? Thankfully, Rick gets a little help when Arn Anderson pulls Kurt Hennig out of the ring for a beatdown and Rick's able to lock Wyndham in the figure 4. Kurt gets back in and the heels go for a double suplex but David low blows Kurt and this allows Rick to cover Wyndham. Flair only gets a 2 though. Kurt then grabs David and he smacks him across the face. The enforcer then hits Hennig from behind with his tire iron. Arn with an iron. And, and look at this, look at Hennig grabbing David to make the cover. David wins the match for his team via pinfall even though he wasn't a legal man. And yeah absolute disaster of a match right here. Now, give David credit for stepping in there. The pressure must have been absolutely immense and again, you could tell by his body language that he was a bag of nerves. But we're talking big money pay-per-views in this era and no one will ever convince me that David Flair was ready for a match on WCW Worldwide, never mind WCW sold out. David was inexperienced, he was still in training when this match happened, but he gets a proper introduction to WCW when the NWO launch an attack after the match. The black and white come out first. First, they beat Arn, David and Rick down, the NW Elite then show up including Hulk Hogan and Flair gets handcuffed to the ring ropes. David gets shoved around like a little kid getting picked on in school and well David gets his shit kicked in when he throws himself into Hulk Hogan in a fit of rage. Hogan whips David over and over again with his weight belt and Ric Flair was apparently very upset during this because he felt Hogan and company were taking liberties. The boys spray Easy e on David's back and they continue to beat and whip young David as his dad looks on, completely helpless. Rick also said that David didn't complain at all about this and he took the ass kicking like a man. Remember too that David's only 19 years old here and he's getting attacked by 30 and 40 year old dudes. 
And look, as much fun as it is to poke fun at David Flair, and trust me, we're going to be doing a whole lot more of that in the future, this piece of TV was still incredibly effective at showing how relentless the NWO were. You feel bad for David when he crawls back to his dad only to get pulled away again for another whipping. You feel bad for Rick crying because he failed to protect his boy. It is kind of messed up if the NWO and Hogan took liberties here with a kid without discussing it beforehand, but I say it was mission accomplished from a storyline perspective. Scott Hall used a kettle prod on Goldberg at Starcade 98. Goldberg lost the heavyweight championship and his undefeated streak, so JJ Dillon's booked a ladder match tonight where the kettle prod will be suspended above the ring. That's our story and that's all we need. Scott Hall knows a thing or two about ladder matches so I'm genuinely excited to see what he can do here. He grabs a mic and he says he's got good news and he's got bad news. The good news is the fans that sold out get to see a guy standing at 6 foot 6 and more handsome than 10 movie stars, that being Scott Hall. The bad news is Goldberg wet his pants backstage, he slipped on his own piss and now he's got a boo boo on his knee. So not only was Scott instrumental in ending the streak, it looks like he was also instrumental in ending Goldberg's career. Scott wants Pee Wee Anderson to raise his hand, but Goldberg's music plays in the arena and he's here. We don't get the usual security entrance, but we do get Billy Boy in a knee brace. So whatever happened earlier on, it's put Goldberg at a disadvantage heading into this ladder match. The two shove each other and clearly Goldberg has a lot more power than Scott. The bad guy hits the mat a few times and he goes down after a shoulder block. Hall then pokes Goldberg in the eye and he moves on to the former champ's arm and shoulder. But a clothesline puts Hall down again and Scott really needs to get that ladder involved early on. This isn't going well. Goldberg lands a punch, Scott gets floored, Scott then goes for a body slam afterwards, this doesn't work. When Goldberg performs a slam however, he hurts his knee as evidenced by his reaction afterwards. Scott Hall smells blood and he goes for the knee right away and when Goldberg tries to fight back with a power slam, he ends up doing more damage to himself. The bad guy now has a chance to beat Goldberg it seems. He goes to work on that injured knee and he utilizes the apron and the ring post to do as much damage as possible. The commentators say they have never seen Goldberg in this kind of state before as Scott goes to retrieve the ladder. But Goldberg gets up and he meets Hall on the rampway. He's hobbling around pretty bad here and Scott easily pushes Bill into the ladder, causing both men to fall down but Goldberg gets the worst of it. Still, Bill hits Scott at the guardrail before throwing him back in the ring. This leads to Hall performing a baseball slide into the ladder and the former champ gets wiped out. Goldberg then gets busted open when Scott whacks his head on the ring steps. This lady's reaction says it all really if you look close. The match then gets back in the ring and Scott goes for the stun gun, but he instead changes his mind and he hurts Goldberg a little more with an elbow drop. Scott goes up again, he ends up taking a back suplex, so clearly Goldberg needs hurt a little more and Scott decides to drop the ladder across Bill's back. The next attempt from Scott is also unsuccessful, he ends up getting bounced off the top rope, so the strategy remains the same, weaken Goldberg and try again. This time Goldberg clotheslines Scott and when Hall tries to throw his opponent into the ladder, Goldberg reverses it. The crowd are now on their feet and gotta say, this hasn't been bad at all. Goldberg goes crazy next while hitting Scott with the ladder, Scott takes a few hard shots and Goldberg's now in complete control. He goes for the cattle prod, Scott manages to dropkick the ladder, Hall goes for the prize once again but he takes a pretty bad bump when he gets pushed off. If you thought that was bad, wait until you see this. Goldberg climbs up again but Disco Inferno shows up to push him off. Bill tries to grab the top rope but he misses and his neck takes all the impact. This could have been really bad but thankfully he was alright afterwards. Disco sets up the ladder, he helps Scott to his feet, Hall then grabs the kettle prod and all Scott has to do now is zap his opponent. He tries his best but Goldberg isn't done yet. Goldberg fights back, a sidekick leads to the kettle prod flying out of Scott's hand and Goldberg's able to grab the weapon before the bad guy. The crowd goes absolutely crazy when the two get back in the ring. Scott tries to reason with Goldberg but he isn't going to get out of this one. And this next part I thought was awesome. Goldberg throws the kettle prod in the air and when Scott tries to grab it, the bad guy gets speared. So good. Hall then gets jackhammered and Goldberg wins the match after giving Hall a shock. Immediately after the bell, Bam Bam Bigelow shows up to attack Goldberg and the show goes off the air with Hall zapping both men. This Bigelow thing better lead to a match soon because it's starting to drag on a bit. Not a bad match honestly. Scott Hall has had better ladder matches in the past of course, but at the same time, Goldberg's also had way worse main events. So 
Sold Out 99 was not a good show. It's the same story as always with highs and lows, but we're now getting to a point where the low points outweigh the high points. I loved Smiley vs Guerrero, Raph vs Bigelow wasn't bad either and I thought the main event was pretty decent for a Goldberg match. The cruiserweight match didn't live up to expectations though, David Flair was terrible in the ring although the final moments of that match were kinda interesting. And then the likes of Benoit vs Zenith and Hummer vs Finlay were just throwaway time wasters that shouldn't have been put on pay per view. Pick and choose what to watch out of Sold Out 99. Honestly, I've covered worse WCW pay per views in this series but it's by no means a good show. Join me next week though and we'll see how WCW president Ric Flair responds to everything that happened at Sold Out. Thanks for watching guys and take care.